Hi, welcome back to part two of Phil Adams' Seven Minute Sound Bites. If you do have time, then do please watch the whole episode. It's full of gems and pearls of wisdom from Phil. And if you're enjoying the show, please follow us, like us on your favorite podcast player, or subscribe on YouTube, as it's really going to help us grow the show. Now, over to Phil. I took some stills of famous Shakespearean actors. So, you know, Kenneth Branagh playing Henry V and Marlo Brand- Marlon Brando, I think he's playing Mark Antony, Ian McKellen in Macbeth. And there was Laurence Olivier was one, and then Hugh Kwashi playing Othello. And I took lyrics or stanzas from We Are the Champions and put them over those still frames of, of, of these famous Shakespearean actors. And it does not feel out of place. I think he, particularly when he wrote in the first person, as he did, does in that song, he, he, there's a Shakespearean quality to, to his lyric. And I, I, I do think about this stuff a lot, you know, through storytelling for clients and writing about lyrics. And there's a really interesting book, which I pulled out, which is this one here. It's a translation of a, of a, of a Greek philosopher called Hermogenes. And he wrote on these types of style. And I bookmarked it here. But he says that the, that the, what, what all writers are looking for is writing that has force, which I think everyone would agree we are the champions has force. But there are six components of writing that has force. And there's some obvious ones. So clarity is one, character is one, and sincerity is one. But there are other characteristics of, of writing that has force. And there are things like grandeur and beauty. And, and grandeur is, 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 is made up of things like solemnity and vehemence and brilliance and fluorescence. And I think, I doubt very much that Freddie Mercury had read Hermogenes on style. But like Shakespeare, it naturally, his writing has, has that, that attribute of force that is a combination of all those other things. There's a passage here. It says, Hermogenes Realize that a speech that is extremely clear runs the risk of appearing to be trite, commonplace, or obvious. In his discussion of grandeur, he therefore deals with the various ways in which an, or- an orator can keep the clear from appearing to be mundane. And that's what Freddie Mercury does. His language is really simple. It's not polysyllabic, but it has that grandeur and anything but mundane, and therefore it carries huge force. So yeah, I, I don't think it's remotely ridiculous to compare him with Shakespeare. And as I say, when you put those lyrics against those Shakespearean actors, it looks like the words could be coming out of their mouths. For the ancient Greeks who came up with the idea of democracy, elections were in, inherently undemocratic. And the etymology of the word democracy is are the Greek words demos, which is citizens or the populace of a country and kratos, which is power. So dem- democracy literally means power to the people. And through elections, we're basically outsourcing our agency and our power to elected representatives who actually don't represent the majority of us. So it doesn't work as, from first principles, it doesn't work as a democratic system at all. I was talking to some people from the transition movement the other day who, you know, who basically their working assumption or their conclusion that they've drawn from all the available data is that capitalism has to end for us to have any chance. And the sooner that happens, the better. But again, one of the issues they've got is, okay, well, you're going to scrap capitalism. What are you going to replace it with? And how can I, as an individual, regardless of my circumstances, how can I imagine that that's going to be better than what I've got now? I think for someone like me, particularly, I've got a comfortable lifestyle. According to conventional wisdom, I've got a lot to lose from this transition that they're so keen on. So I really need some help to imagine something better. In theory, someone who is suffering from fuel poverty and is having to make decisions about whether to heat their home or to, to eat, someone who is having to use food banks, mm-hmm. and someone living in poverty, it should be easier for them to imagine a better alternative because anything is better than the current reality. I don't think it works that way though. I think the system is so all powerful. It's almost impossible to imagine an alternative when you're within it. And that, that sort of being a catalyst 
for people's imagination is it's such an important job that needs doing. And you'd think that the ad industry is perfectly placed to do that. I just don't think it is because I think it's so much a cog of the machine mm. of capitalism that it's, it's quite hard to smash the system from within. I think a, a life well lived is a voyage of discovery. So two of my five things would be under that sort of heading. So one is just do things, do stuff. And you know, you, ne you never know what's going to happen as a result of doing things to so do things and go places. And maybe a third one actually under that heading of a voyage of discovery, do things, go places and make a point of talking to people. One of the beauties of this job, particularly the strategy side, is I get paid to talk to people, you know, my clients, audiences, my clients, clients, my clients, customers, and everyone's got a story and you learn something from everybody. Such a privilege to actually get paid to do that. But I think, yeah, to do things, go places and talk to people. Those would be three of them and they're all related. I, I think a lesson in life. I think there's a, there's a thing I'm really taken with, which is the asymmetry of favors. And again, it creates serendipity, but particularly online and it doesn't cost you an awful lot in terms of time, but the value of those connections for the people involved can be huge. So there's a huge asymmetry there, low cost to you, huge benefit to them. And I think again, a life well lived is about doing as many of those low cost favors as you can, because each of those favors could have huge value for somebody else at very low cost to you. And that, that used to play out in the early days of social media, the technology actually facilitated that process. It was really easy mm -hmm. if someone had, 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 had written something interesting to share that, you know, it took seconds to share it, yeah. might have huge value to the person who'd written it seems to have been lost of late, I think, in social media. But nonetheless, the principle still applies. That by and large, it costs very little to do a favor, but the benefit to the recipient can be huge. And if, if everyone was living according to that maxim, then we'd probably be doing better than we are. Okay, that's all for now, folks. Now, here's my ask of you. Please follow this podcast on Apple or Spotify or whatever player you use. Also, please subscribe to our new Random Collisions newsletter. We really are working to build a global community of action takers, action engines of people that really care about the problems that need solving. Thank you very much, and see you next time.